Welcome to Neuro Noodles, Neurofeedback, the Neuropsychology Podcast featuring tech legend Jay Gunkelman. He is the man who has read well over a half a million brain scans. Our goal is to provide information and promote options for better mental health. The Neuro Noodle Podcast is supported by listeners and businesses just like you. MindMedia.com. Get the latest EEG and neurofeedback technology from MindMedia.com. Their semi-dry sensor cap is a wonder to see, and their EEG amplifiers have been trusted in the field for decades. Their neurofeedback and QEEG courses will get you up to speed in no time. Visit MindMedia.com now. Hey, Gunkelman. Well, Pete, <laughs> um, uh, so you, you pick an a interesting current topic um, Go and, and, a, and an interesting twist to connect it to the neurofeedback world and, and therapy as well. So um, congratulations well, on grabbing a, a topic of interest that we can uh, possibly hook in another 3,000 people or something. That is that is correct, Jay. What is this? What is this magic topic that you speak of? Well, you you suggested that we look at Ozempic, um, and you know it's a popular uh, specific uh, drug. Uh, it's a class of drugs, actually, uh, semaglutids. They're uh, Rebelsis and uh, Wygovi. How do they come up with these names? Why Govi? What, what kind of name is that? You know. So, uh, but Ozempic. What kind of name is that? Yeah. Uh, they they ran out of all the good names uh, years ago. So the uh, they've got all these odd ones. So. Well, they ran out of all the product too. You can't find it anywhere. Well, um, the there is a shortage of it because of the 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 mass insanity of the. Social media population and, trying to get at it. Yeah. It's, it's intended to work on type two diabetes, not for pudginess, you know. And um, it, it's a GLP one agonist. And uh, you know, if you punch into the internet uh, Ozempic clinic near me, just using one of the brand names or Ribelsis or Semaglutid, you get thousands and thousands of hits, and that. When you put in the near me, it you know it looks for your location, and you've got a certain radius that they give you. I'm sure you'd get you know hundreds of thousands if you just punch in Ozempic Clinic, but it, it's it, it's extraordinarily popular. But as you say, they're running out of you know uh, um, real uh, uh, compounded uh, product from the company, and the compounding pharmacies are making their own and uh, providing it to these clinics. So don't you know that Novo Nordisk, which is the 2012, uh, you know, original approved manufacturer, um, they're suing. Uh, the, the compounding pharmacies are making it, but some of them are making it as a salt and some of them are making it as an acetate. And neither one of those have been proven safe and effective. So there. What is a compounding pharmacy? Uh, a compounding pharmacy is a pharmacy that can make a drug for you out of basic chemicals. And uh, they're not the primary pharmacy that a uh, pr primary company that has the patent for it, but they're, they're making uh, essentially uh, 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 Yes. Um, I'm, I'm confused. Generic, a yeah, generic that's uh, what... uh, compound. So, and they, they can whip it together the, however they want. Uh, if you go to a compounding pharmacy for uh, testosterone, you could get it from a, a variety of different uh, uh, forms uh, in, you know, dissolved in oil. Uh, what kind of oil? Oh, there's a few. Uh, <laughs> um, cottonseed oil is not uncommon, uh, but you can get it in a few different kinds. It's not all just testosterone, cypionate, enanthate. There's there's a number of different ways they can formulate it. So uh, um, so the 
the primary company is suing these because the the way they're making it is not necessarily even proven safe or effective. So, but you know, it's it's supposed to reduce your cravings, and you know that that's a, oh probably a reasonable thing if you if you're a type two diabetic and you're carrying around extra weight and and you know type two diabetes is essentially triglyceride uh, related. It's not your pancreas having failed um, as type one diabetes where you're insulin dependent. In fact, Ozepix, you know, specifically you know, says this is not for somebody who's got type one diabetes. And uh, it, it, it forces uh, a certain amount of insulin out and it stops your craving. So you stop eating earlier and they don't have that appetite. Yeah. But you know, uh, the drive towards eating is a specific spot in the brain. And one of the weird, I mean, very weird side effects of it is that it eliminates one of the psychological presentations. It's not actually a diagnostic category, but most people working in therapy know about misophonia. Misophonia is somebody's, <clears throat> pardon me, somebody's kind of an obsessive, uh, focus on the sound of eating or uh, uh, per personal sounds uh, from usually people close to them. And misophonia is uh, dr driven down by uh, Ozempic and Rebelsis and Wygovia. So we, where is misophonia driven? Well, it's an OCD, an obsessive compulsive drive same spot craving is you know the anterior cingulates a reward center and you can have reward deficiency syndrome uh which uh <clears throat> pardon me it, it has to do with addiction you know, which could be to food you know um yep. uh or drugs or 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 i mean uh it's quite flexible if you're not addicted you know if you're in a therapy to stop you from being addicted to drugs and your anterior cingulate is the problem and they're not fixing that, you might be clean and sober, but you're going to find internet porn or gambling, uh, playing the horses, some, you know, something, you'd be locked onto something else. Your, your cingulate is very creative. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll, it will find something, you know? So, um, you know, don't, yeah, uh, don't, don't think that, uh, uh, the anterior cingulate isn't creative enough to find something else if it's still a problem. But if you've wiped out craving and misophonia and um, a lot of other anterior cingulate drives, um, you're working deep in the brain. Now, <clears throat> oh, sounds great. Let's, you know, let's go online and, you know, find some. Well, first of all, some of it are injections, and that'll put a lot of people off right there. <laughs> uh, yeah. Here, inject this. Are you kidding me? I'm not going to stick a needle in myself. You know, I, I do it all the time. I uh, I have to. Um, you get used to that sort of thing. Uh, right. Diabetics, you know, do it all the time too. Uh, they they hate the finger prick worse than the injection. Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, but you know, it's not just purely benefit i mean what's the possible things that could possibly go wrong taking these drugs no it's like diabetic retinopathy so your vision blurs after you start taking it i mean blurs blurs to the point where you know the it, it's as though you've got an advanced uh, cataract everything's blurred pancreatitis <laughs> that's that doesn't sound very good, does it? You know, um, well, it's, it's forcing your pancreas to produce stuff that, it, you know, and anytime you're influencing something in the body like that, you can end up having difficulties. Kidney problems, uh, uh, gallbladder issues. Well, you know, pa pancreas and gallbladder are somewhat related, but the, the, the gallbladder uh, holds uh, digestive uh, uh, juices and uh uh, that uh, allowed for uh, digestion, and uh, you you can have uncontrolled diarrhea. So 
if you're going to go out somewhere, you've got to kind of plan out where the hell the bathroom is going to be because I, I might have to go. And it's not just a little poopy. This is, this is explosive uh, di diarrhea, uh, bloating, uh, nausea, um, you know. And then there's some that are not that bad. I mean, cosmetic problems. Well, cosmetic problems are very, very bad if that's what you're doing it for, I guess. If, if what you're doing it for is to look better, how about Ozempic Old Face? Oh, what the hell's Old Face? Yeah, what is it? <laughs> well, you know, nice you, see, <laughs> you, you see somebody is somebody in their their 40s and, and 50s that are a little bit overweight. They got a little pudginess in the face, not just elsewhere. Yeah. And as they lose weight elsewhere and their body is starting to look great and they look in the mirror, they think, my God, who's that old person with the, the, the sunken cheeks and the, the droopy face? I mean, you just took a bunch of bulk out of your face, yeah. skin, and, and it's now got a bit of a droop. So old face uh, or Zempic face um, it ends up being something. Ozempic finger. Ozempic hand size. You lose enough weight that you got to get your rings resized. And then there's the infamous Ozempic butt. And what? I don't even want to describe an Ozempic butt. You know, it's, uh, it's just, uh, <laughs> if you thought an Ozempic face was a bad one, Ozempic butt's got to be terrible. So, um, but we don't walk around hanging our butt out of our pants. Well, I live in the Bay Area, so. Yeah, once in a while, you see that too. Um, it, so, you know, what can you do to stop having the cravings? Yeah. Without ruining your butt, your ring size, your wrist, ozempic face, your your, your pancreas, your gallbladder. Um, you know, without without stepping on all these physiologic processes. How can we kind of fix that misophonia without taking drugs? An alternative. A good alternative. One that doesn't have the kinds of side effects that you have by taking pharma. You know, for everything you do with a drug in the brain, where the drug is intended to latch onto a ligand-gated ion channel to control a neuron, you have voltage-gated ion channels. So you can grab onto that neuron with a voltage-gated ion channel using techniques like TMS, TDCS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, transcranial direct current stimulation, transcranial alternating current stimulation at various frequencies, pulsed EMF on the head. I mean, there's, there's lots and lots of techniques that you can use to influence brain function. The thing is, you got to know what you're doing with them and you have to point it at the right spot. So who's done this kind of stuff? Yeah, who? <laughs> well, you know, uh, um, th there, are, there are some medical mavericks out there that are so brilliant that they invent medical procedures. Um, they're the ones who come up with new approaches um, and things like that. One such character is Dirk de Ritter, MD, PhD, obviously more well-schooled than I. And he's got laboratories in both New Zealand and Belgium. Now, that's a commute. So, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's a, a world-class figure, and, and, yeah, and you see him all over the damn world, um, and, and extremely well-respected. Um, he invented... Uh, the ability to implant an electrode to turn off tinnitus. And, you know, <laughs> the, the, uh, he was the first one in the world to do it. And I'll tell you, the ear, nose, and throat department at the hospital tried to stop him. You know, uh, or you, <laughs> you know, it was approved by the IRB. The patient had approved. It was the first one ever done. Uh, and uh, it, it, uh, it ended up... Uh, uh, the, the hospital was trying to call it off. Uh, they, they contacted Dirk the night before his first implant surgery and said, 
you can't do this. If you do this, you're going to be fired. <laughs> well, uh, so instead of starting the surgery at 8.30 in the morning, he called the surgical suite and said, this is Dr. Deritter. I've got a suite reserved for 8.30. I'd like it to be ready at 7.30. So he started a surgery an hour earlier than anyone thought he was going to. And once you've got somebody's head wide open, you do not end up stopping that surgery. So at 8.30, the head of the hospital, the head of ENT, we're in the gallery up above, and uh, um, we're, we're absolutely aghast that the surgery had been uh, completed. And uh, they called him in and chastised him for it and said, for God's sakes, don't tell anybody that this was done. He says, oh, well, I already talked to the press. <laughs> and he argued back and forth with them about whether it was a good thing for people to know about the surgery or not. And then when he realized it was past the time for the presses to be running, he said, well, I'll call the press and try and call it off. And he called and then talked to the head of the hospital and said, oh, my, oh, my, the presses are already running. So the, the, the and the, the publicity was tremendous support for the hospital. So they, they, they kind of didn't punish him after they became famous for the surgery. So he's he's a world class maverick and and uh, has come up with um, anterior cingulate implants for uh, people with severe obesity um, and also for uh, uh, anorexia. It's not just obesity. I mean, you can be locked on or locked off. And if you're locked on, you have like an OCD eating thing. If you're locked off, you your OCD is you have an obsession against food and uh, um, or anorexia uh, uh, can end up being it or bulimia. So um, eating disorders can be treated if they're very, very severe with a brain surgery implanting to the anterior cingulate, the same spot that these drugs apparently are, are, are working on. And, you know, Dirk's a neurosurgeon, but he's, he's an academic neurosurgeon. He comes up with surgeries and teaches people how to do brand new things. Uh, he invented burst mode stimulation for implanted stimulators, uh, which make them look a little bit more like brain activity to the brain. So um, he can implant a stimulator at the anterior cingulate uh, to turn off craving, but he also has done neurofeedback. Now you think of a neurosurgeon, well, why would they do neurofeedback? They got a knife right there, you know? Well, uh, less invasive is a good thing if you can fix it from the outside and not have the risk of the surgery. So he actually did infra low frequency training anterior cingulate and turned off craving. Now, they, this is recent enough. They haven't done long-term follow-up. Uh, the de decrease in craving. Now, that's what uh, uh, Ozempic does. It cuts out your craving. So you, you, you don't have the drive towards eating. So working on the same spot, getting the same kind of an outcome, and he can do that with Neurofeedback, infra low frequency training uh, at the anterior cingulate. So, Jay, and, what what would be digital Ozempic? Uh, well, um, uh, training the anterior cingulate. Now, the trick is the anterior cingulate actually has three failure modes. Just because you know where to treat doesn't mean you know how to treat it unless you know how to look at it and figure it out first. You could have a failure with beta could have a failure with alpha, and you could have a failure with theta. The healthy cingulate is flexible. The cingulate that's failed gets rid of your flexibility, so you're stuck on this craving, or you're stuck off, so you're resisting. But it, it's there's no longer the flexibility that the, the a healthy cingulate would provide. So, you know, if it's the slow variety, it's likely an thalamocortical dysrhythmia where things have slowed down and uh, you have a coupling between the fast and the slow content. And for those people, they put in an implant in the anterior cingulate uh, to turn off the dysrhythmia. Um, uh, Dirk DeRitter's group published um, 
uh, a paper um, that showed that you could actually identify the thalamic cortical dysrhythmia with a machine learning algorithm and sort out what kind of patient you had, whether it was tinnitus or pain or Parkinsonism or this anterior cingulate reward deficiency syndrome. So if you've got a thalamic cortical dysrhythmia, the frequency you'll see up there will be theta, but there will be a high frequency beta, like a gamma or a high frequency beta coupled with it. Uh, they're, they're, those two frequencies are very uh, divergent on the frequency spectrum. One's high, one's low. Um, but when they're dancing together, they're coupled. Uh, and when they're coupled, you have this dysrhythmia. So, uh, and the, the thalamic cortical dysrhythmia was uh, uh, Rodolfo Linus uh, 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 found it in Parkinsonism first. Uh, George Ritter found it in tinnitus, had a thousand people uh, in a database, and um, they found the nice dysrhythmia and uh, that an algorithm that would uh, identify uh, tinnitus versus normal. Very, very, very accurately, better than 90% accurate. Well, in walks a person with Parkinsonism. It says tinnitus, <laughs> you know, and he had no tinnitus, he had Parkinsonism. He had the same dysrhythmia. That's when they turn the machine learning algorithm loose to tell him not only is there a dysrhythmia, but where is it? And the location ends up determining which pathology. It's a basic failure mode of the brain. And uh, you, 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 once you've identified it uh, and localized it, uh, you can end up treating it. Um, you can treat it from the outside with stimulation technologies, TMS, TVCS, etc. Or alternatively, you can go in after it if you're a DERP or somebody who's a neurosurgeon uh, experienced in these things. And uh, Dirk is the one who invented it, so he's the one who's got the experience at this point. So um, the simulation technologies vary. Uh, uh, TMS is, eh, you know, if you find a small inexpensive device it might be 80 to a hundred thousand dollars but most of the big ones are 200 plus um thousand dollars and very expensive very expensive treatments um and uh, you have to have the right kind of coil to reach the anterior cingulate uh, but they're doing treatments um tdcs um well uh, as expensive as tms was tdcs is inexpensive it, it, it can give you the same kind of an outcome, uh, but it's, it's, a, uh, it's hundreds of dollars as opposed to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, TACS, also inexpensive. Uh, Pulse TMF, uh, also uh, inexpensive. So um, you, you can go hog wild and spend big money for the stimulation technology, or uh, you can do it on, on a... Uh, shoestring budget. Um, uh, it, TMS forces the brain to have a discharge. It creates uh, action potentials, discharges. Uh, you can make the fingers wiggle. You can make the toes wiggle. Uh, you force activity. DC stim, AC stim, post TMF, they potentiate function. They increase the probability of a function by priming the cortex towards discharge, increasing the electronegativity of the basal membrane, increases the likelihood of a pyramidal cell discharging. So uh, T DCS, TDCS, basically, you put the plus electrode above the area you want to activate, and um, um, uh, uh, that will make more electronegativity on the basal membrane. The, that's the opposite polarity of what you put up there. And it's pretty easy to think of the plus electrode making more and the minus electrode making less. So you don't have to think too much if you don't want to think. Uh, just put the, put the one on that makes more or less. Um, the thing is, in order to get down to the, uh, to, to the actual uh, cingulate, you have to end up having not just a plus and a minus on the surface. That gives you surface uh, transit between the two electrodes. We're trying to get deep down below the one electrode. So you put one electrode on the anterior cingulate, 
we put four reference electrodes on the side, F7, F8, T7, T8. And those four reference points get only one fourth of the, um, of, of the other current. So if you have theta, you need to activate. You put the plus there. If you have alpha, you need to activate. You put the plus there. Some people have beta spindles, not slow content, not alpha, but beta spindles. There, you have to put the minus on top of it. Beta spindles require an inhibitory, not an excitatory uh, stimulation. So you, you pick the polarity properly and you stick enough electrodes on. There's also very expensive DC stem, uh, high density DC stem, where they put the entire cap, a high density cap of electrodes on, and they have a computer model that tells them what polarity to place at which electrode site and how much current density. So they kind of, in a computer model, uh, figure out how to guide the currents with all the sites on the surface to the spot they're looking at deep in the brain. And, you know, high density DC stim is now expensive again. Uh, the, 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 the lots of electrodes, lots of amplifier, I mean, lots of uh, uh, stimulation, the computer modeling, um, yeah, it, it, it's all, um, uh, you know, back up in uh, multiple tens of thousands to get a, a high density DC stim. Uh, AC stim usually is being done inexpensively, um, and it, it's not as uh, directable as the DC stim. And um, people are just trying to figure out which frequencies to use for what application. So uh, transcranial AC stim is is a, a, a more uh, of an emerging application compared to DC stim, which has been being done. Uh, well, <laughs> it was being done in the olden days. Pliny the Elder uh, did DC stim using electric eels on people's heads. Um, now we. We don't use a slimy fish anymore. We use slimy electrodes instead. But uh, we've come a long ways from Pliny the Elder, who was described by Claudius Galen as having done this. So, um, yeah, it, it goes back to ancient, ancient times as a technique for DC. AC stim, again, much newer, uh, less well known exactly how to do, what to do, where to do. Uh, but there are large groups of clinical people working uh, together to kind of come up with the rules of the road for how AC stim works. AC stim can be pink noise, white noise AC stim, pink noise AC stim, brown noise AC stim, some newer ones, violet and so forth. So there's there's uh, different kinds of frequencies that can be used for the AC stim as well. So, uh, um, you know, um, it, it's, it, it's, as I say, it's an emerging application, but it's still inexpensive. Um, and Pulse DMF, um, uh, Pulse DMF uses coils, um, and uh, what frequency the coils are pulsed at are very much like the AC stim. Uh, the Pulse DMF is uh, uh, being evaluated at this point as to exactly how to use it clinically. The rules of the road are being uh, kind of hammered out by the users uh, uh, using it and finding what works for them. So this is not an exhaustive li list of potential things that can be used to uh, access these areas, um, but uh, these are the ones that have uh, some uh, neuroscientific basis to expect them to have a positive influence. So, and so, again, so, so you Jay, have to go deep to get the singular. It's not a surface, uh, a surface function. So, Jay, let's just say we're getting creative here with the marketing. And we're trying to ride the wave, and we're a, we're a neurofeedback practitioner, and we're saying, uh, oh, you can't find Ozempic. You don't want to deal with a needle. Why don't you try digital Ozempic? How many sessions? <laughs> the, you know, efficacy. 
I, not exa- everybody's different. I get it, but yeah, not to make a claim, just to set the expectations for the practitioner and then for the client going in. So um, the the infra low frequency training to decrease cravings is a published study, um, but it's a recently published study, and um, the application is. Um, an emerging application for uh, feedback and stimulation technologies, but it's a promising one. So I would suggest that this is, uh, uh, um, it's a rational approach. It's a scientifically uh, 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 designed approach. There's, there's science under, underlying it, not just uh, uh, some belief system. Although, uh, uh, as they say, uh, it, you'll you'll see it when you believe it. So um, uh, the, the scientific folks will see the underlying science, and and that'll allow them to have some belief in the in the possible outcome. But what we've got here is um, uh, another spot in the brain that needs to be regulated properly, and that's what we do. Uh, if we can stop epilepsy, we can stop snacking. You know, I, th- this is, we've worked at the anterior cingulate with obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, oppositional defiant, addiction. Um, we, we can work with this. In our work on addiction, one third of the people that were drug addicted actually had an anterior cingulate based addiction, not an over arousal addiction. Most people think alpha theta for addiction. That's only for two thirds of the addicted population that have over arousal. If you have an anterior cingulate problem, you, you can't be doing posterior alpha theta. You expect them to get better. You have to go to the anterior cingulate to fix that. We showed in a publication that all of the people, all 30 individuals that were addicted ended up with uh, uh, clean and sober and much better intellectual functioning. Standard score 20 point jumps on almost everything, including the GIA, which is the IQ equivalent in the Woodcock Johnson 3. So we, we've seen the ability to actually influence the anterior cingulate with neurofeedback. Um, uh, if somebody had an eating disorder that was based on an obsessive drive uh, we can work with the obsessive drive. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't really piggyback on uh, uh, kind of the, the hot topic uh, and, and kind of put an ozempic face, uh, not, not to make fun of uh, people that have ozempic face, but put an ozempic face on another treatment. Um, uh, I, I'd rather just promote our work as our work. And if you have singular problems, you have singular problems, we can work with that. Um, and there are others that it, it end up doing uh, promotion and advertising that will probably jump on this. But um, yeah, I, I just try to continue to promote the flexibility of what you can do with uh, training the brain to work better. And it's you know, from ADD to depression to obsession to bipolar to uh, intractable epilepsy. That there's none of these areas that we can't end up with good outcomes. So, um, you know, if it has a brain in it, um, we can teach you to optimize brain function. And um, if you're Brain function has you with an OCD over focus on food or food noises, like as somebody who has misophonia. Uh, that that anterior cingulate failure uh, can be uh, fixed, so your cravings uh, are controlled and your misophonia is controlled, and uh, your anterior cingulate reward center is functional as opposed to being locked on to something or locked off. Okay, what I'm looking so, at is the, is the trade-off here because Wegovy or Wegovy, whatever the hell you call that, Ozempic, that's about thirteen hundred bucks a month. Insurance doesn't cover it, and 
I believe it's four doses. You take it once a week, 1300 bucks. Okay. And when you stop taking it, the cravings come back. If you do neurofeedback, let's just say a session is 140 bucks a session, right? Uh, two, two sessions a week, right? It's mm-hmm. really, it's about the same amount of money. Okay. And I'm guessing but you end up with a skill. At a the skill, end. right, right. So this could be, stop me if I'm wrong. Is this like a 20 to 40 session type thing? Everybody's different, but just trying to set the expectations. Yeah, typically this is running in the 40 session range. 40, okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and you know, it varies. Uh, there are some people that get it quicker, like 20, but you don't, you know, you don't want to uh, advertise uh well, the world's fastest runner does it this fast, so you can do it that fast. Well, the hell you can, you know. So um, we try to give a realistic expectation, and the 40s is a more realistic expectation. Now, if you have an obsessive compulsive drive and other things, learning disabilities, uh, sleep disorders, there, there are things that can end up stretching out a learning curve. Uh, if you're not sleeping well, you're not consolidating memory well. So learning curves are slow. Uh, if you have a learning disability on top of this, you know, craving thing, uh, that that's going to slow down a learning curve as well. So there's some things that are going to stretch it out, yeah. but 40s are realistic for, you know, the 80 plus percent of the people are going to be able to get it in about that. Yeah, range. yeah. And, and we're not being exact. There's no magic wand, but from a cost benefit, that's about four months worth of these treatments. Okay, and you stop the treatment with Ozempic, the cravings come back. After your 40, 50 sessions, whatever it is, you've learned a skill, and it, that's the alternative, right? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I've, I've got co-pays over $1,000 for some of my meds, so yeah, they, they keep me alive. <laughs> so, you know, uh, and every time I... I go, the person at the counter always says, you realize what the copay is? You know, I say, yes, I do. Yes, um, I do. You know, and, you know what's, what's my choice? <laughs> you know, right. pay, pay the money or uh, go home and pass, you know? So, uh, yeah. Well, I think the needle is a big deterrent for some people. Uh, yeah. That Even though it's a tiny little needle, uh I'm sure, but it's still a deterrent, and I'm sure there'll be a pill coming up. Yeah, yeah Rebelsa says a pill. And, you know, Elon Musk uh, did it, and he's promoting it. All the social media influencers are doing it. So for the practitioners out there, you know, you could say, hey, try digital Ozempic. Yeah, well, uh, you, you, uh, you, you, the, the, there probably will be people that uh, su- suggest uh, that uh, the anterior single treatment could be a digital ozempic if they're targeting the uh, obesity um, and On the type two diabetes. So thank goodness Dr. Marie is not on the show today. We can get away with saying all this stuff, Jay. <laughs> I, I, I I would say all of this with anybody here. So I know, I know. But then that's me. I you know I I don't have any <laughs> normal. No, so she'll give, she'll, she'll give us a hard so, time. We'll edit this out in post. <laughs> well, we we do have uh, um, uh, 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 a society that uh, kind of advertises uh, perfect uh, body image sort of stuff, and it ruins uh, the self-image of a lot of people who are never going to end up having the perfect body. And, you know, uh, people go to... Ex- extraordinary uh, expenses and uh, risk their their life. I mean, go south of the border for uh, uh, inexpensive cosmetic surgery and and not come home. That's not yeah. an unheard of story. So, um, or come home and have, you know, stuff having been put in you that migrates around and causes autoimmune issues and whatnot. Um, uh, <laughs> the Brazilian butt lift people who go down and have that done that end up having all sorts of problems from it. So, well, uh, you know, I don't, obviously, uh, 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 appearances are the last thing I'm concerned about. 
Well, Jay, it's like everything else. This is, you know, training. So it's a workout. Okay. Diet comes into play. It's not one thing that causes it. It's not one thing that's going to fix it. Yeah. This took this took place over a long period of time to get that way. It's going to take a long period of time to 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 go away. But, yeah, it, it does take time. But I tell you, if you stop the craving and you start to burn something by a little bit of workout, not you don't want to overdo your start on any workout, but it, it's surprising how fast you can start to shed weight when you don't have cravings, so you're not overeating and you start to actually burn some, not just you know, sit and eat and, and, and not burn. So uh, it's it's astounding how fast you can actually healthfully uh, lose weight. Um, you know, uh, you, know you, you, you see all the TV shows where they send people out into the middle of nowhere with no yeah. food and everything. And, uh, you know, they starve for, you know, 20 days or something and you know, lose 30 pounds. But um that we're not trying to suggest that you starve yourself for 30 days and lose weight um th this is going to take away how much you crave and the cravings are going to end up eliminating the midnight raid on the fridge and the the eating between meals and uh, probably cut down on the the overeating within the meal as well and when you do that you've just dropped a you know, a, a lot of calories. Now, when it gives you less cravings, it's not apparently just for food. There's some people who report also less consumption of things like alcohol. And, uh, you know, it's an anterior cingulate and a third of the addiction populations got that. So it's not just for food. It could be addiction to other things. So the, the side effect reward of, having the anterior cingulate working better uh, it, it is substantial. Now, their primary in interest is, you know, uh, pancreas working better and loss of weight. Uh, but when it has a, an effect on the anterior cingulate, and we can see that that's the spot that has the craving, we can intervene without the, the pharma and injections by working on uh, the the uh, voltage gated ion channels in the area that is responsible for the behavior. Jay, for anxious people, is that how anxiety comes into play? They get into that routine and that's what causes the cravings? Like how does not, anxiety come not, in? Not every, not every anxiety is the same as every other anxiety. Right, the right. anterior cingulate is one of the things that can end up with anxiety. Um, uh, if you overfocus on the thing that's making you anxious, that overfocus is the anterior cingulate. Um, you can have anxiety because you can't read your social context, in which case it's the right temporal area, social perception. If you're blind socially and you step into a room, you can't read the room. You don't know if people are happy, angry, um, you know, the if you should duck, I mean, you don't know. Um, you're you're socially blind, uh, so the right temporal is is involved in general anxiety, but not so much in eating disorders. So uh, the, the 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 location that we would work on for craving has already been proven effectively treated using uh, neurofeedback infralow frequency. Now there are other kinds of treatments with neurofeedback as well that they, they haven't gone through the, the same publication level proof but we've got you know, anterior cingulate treatments for ocd and addiction and so forth that have uh, proven just not specifically for craving for food so i'm you know i'm confident that the anterior cingulate treatments would end up being uh, a, a a functional equivalent without the risk factor of uh, retinopathies and and uh, 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 yeah, it, uh, pancreatitis and uh, kidney problems and gallbladder problems. So the last thing you want to do is, is it, end up taking something for a cosmetic purpose and end up with with uh, a, a severe medical uh, uh, problem. And 
pancreatitis is not a, a pleasant circumstance. It's right, uh, right. very painful. Well, well, Jay, it's, it's, you can't get along without your kidneys. And so I hear. If your gallbladder is not working very well, you're going to have uh, you know, gallstones, um, uh, the, the uh, cholecystectomies in your future if you've got gallbladder problems. That's the, the gallbladder surgery. Jay, fascinating show. Digital Ozempic. That's the thumbnail. <laughs> and, you know, uh, um, our, our, our field has applications out there that aren't uh, fully validated, but they're crude equivalencies. And you can see um, uh, the, you know, how you could give a replacement for some other approach. If you've got a pharma approach that works, and you can identify the mechanism of the pharma approach, how and where it's working, uh, you can end up giving a digital replacement. Again, every neuron has ligand-gated ion channels, which meds lock onto, and voltage-gated ion channels that fields and uh, yeah, DC and AC uh, uh, signals end up interacting with, and MagStim works with. So. Uh, we, we can hit the same spots and we, we can excite or inhibit function in the same locations. Uh, so we can largely uh, replace uh, pharma interventions. We work with intractable epilepsy where they want to do brain surgery on them and the individuals are seizure free and medication free. So if you can stop a seizure, you can probably stop a midnight midnight rate on the fridge. So um, put, we, put, we can put the stickers down. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, um, our our technique has a wide variety of applications, uh, only limited by the creativity of the person, you know, uh, uh, wielding the hardware. So um, if if it's got a brain involved with it, uh, we have the ability to in, influence the brain. And uh, not just surface, uh, we, we can influence deeper structures from the surface. Now it has to it has to be something that generates surface EEG that you can lock onto, um, but uh, uh, subcortical structures uh, that we can't see electrically from the surface are involved in circuits. And if the circuit has a surface punt, uh, surface location. That's where you tap into that network. So you don't have to go to the deep site that doesn't generate surface EEG. You can tap into the network that that's hooked into from the surface and influence it. So we're, we're really quite flexible in what we can do. So last question, Jay, and we will say bye-bye. If you're doing the brain scan, the, the EEG, the QEEG, and you, you, the map comes out and you just got that good old uh, heat map, what are you going to see on that thing? Is there, is there going to be a red dot right here? Or like, <laughs> everybody's different, I get it, but. You know, uh, if you want to actually see the anterior cingulate specifically, and you're, you won't look at a surface map, what you'll look for is source analysis uh, using uh, a Loretta approach. Now, Loretta's low resolution electromagnetic tomography, and it can be done a lot of different ways. You can point the Loretta software at a frequency. That's not what it's intended for. It's intended to look for the source of a rhythm. Mm -hmm. Rhythms have generators. Frequencies are a number. You know, not every frequency has a rhythm generator. If you see a, if you see a peak in the spectra, there's a rhythm there. If the spectrum's flat at an area, you can point Loretta at that frequency and it will give a calculation, but it's not a valid source. So you, you need to look for a frequency or a set of frequencies within a component. We generally do component analysis and then do Loretta of the component, which can have cross frequency coupled data in the component. The, Thalamocortical dysrhythmia is cross frequency coupled com, you know, in a component. You'll see the fast and the slow in the same component. If they're dancing to the same drummer, they're in the same component. 
if if they're randomly related, they're they're not of the same component. So uh, when the independent component analysis splits the EG into the components, the ones that are attached to the same drummer, they're together. And if you see fast and slow together, you may have a dysrhythmia. And then it's just where is it, and you can intervene. Uh, and again, uh, tinnitus, pain. Parkinsonism or movement disorders like essential tremor and the reward deficiency. Well, what the hell is reward deficiency? Depression, obsession, uh, uh, eating disorders, cravings, uh, um, uh, anxiety, uh, uh, OCD. We, we have a wide range of things that that anterior can do and uh, the, the disturbance at that location uh, it, it, it is seen as a reward deficiency. And uh, it has to do with a lot of dopamine issues and others, but um, uh, it, it, it's, it's a, a critical piece of turf and uh, we can access it and um, you can spend money on pharma. And when you're done, you haven't learned a damn thing yep. uh, or you but can- You learn how to be on learn- six, seven grand. Yeah, you can learn how to operate the, the generator that they're trying to influence. And by the time you're done, you have a skill set. It's, it's not, nobody can take it away from you. It's something you've learned. And, um, uh, yeah, um, you, you, you are in control. You're not dependent upon. And, you know, being dependent isn't my favorite thing to do. So I, I would prefer being the one in charge. Well, the one in charge is behind you. Hi, Renita. <laughs> Jay Gunkelman, another fascinating show. Great topic. Digital Ozempic. Thank you so much, my friend. You bet. Enjoy your day. The NeuroNoodle Podcast is supported by listeners and businesses just like you. Like our silver supporter, Mind Media. The latest EEG and neurofeedback technology from MindMedia.com. Their semi-dry sensor cap is a wonder to see, and their EEG amplifiers have been trusted in the field for decades. Their neurofeedback and QEEG courses will get you up to speed in no time. Visit MindMedia.com now 